Hey, hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Kathy Anderson. I'm the program director for Chicago Careers in Journalism. It's a program that we launched uh, officially uh, just last year. Um, it is uh, open to everyone um, at any time in your college career. Um, my background is I've been a journalist for more than 25 years. I was at ABC Network News and with ABC for nearly 15 years, and uh, I did documentaries uh, mostly for National PBS uh, for nearly eight years. Um, in the CCIJ program, I mentor students individually uh, to help them get um, uh, internships and jobs. Uh, I do workshops, skill building workshops. Uh, I bring journalists to campus, especially alumni journalists to campus, for informal uh, chats so that you can ask all the real life questions. And uh, so it, and, and it gives students a chance to really network and, and make contacts and uh, so that in the future you can ask for advice and all of that kind of stuff. Um, we've been uh, quite successful uh, with students getting internships at, at Meet the Press, at Oprah's Magazine in New York, at NBC's Political Unit with Chuck Todd, at um, New York Daily News, uh, in London with The Economist, a uh, student uh, covered war crimes trials in Bosnia. We've had them with Bloomberg Business News, uh, in Washington uh, with Atlantic, um, Chicago Tribune, CNN, CBS Evening News, CBS Weekend News, uh, ABC News, um, etc. This year we're developing, uh, we hope, a dozen journalism Metcalf opportunities. Um, we're still um, figuring out some of the details on those so they aren't listed yet, but if it is something that you're interested in, you should check quite often. Um, also, the CCIJ, Chicago Careers in Journalism, uh, I give out uh, CCIJ grants of $3,000 each that can be used to help support um, uh, unpaid journalism internships anywhere in the world. Um, and again, um, if you want my card or anything, uh, just email me. We'll find a time to talk, etc. And Allison Howard um, is going to introduce our panel. Hi. Welcome to the Journalism and Publishing panel. In the center, we have Robert Levy. He's our panel moderator. He's been a journalist with the Washington Post for over 30 years. We also have Jonathan Bruner, who is a deputy editor with Forbes Media. Elizabeth Fama, a self-employed children's book author. Justine Nagan, who is the executive director of Cartimquin Films, a documentary film company based in Chicago. And Diana Gill, a executive editor with HarperCollins. She is in charge of the science fiction division there. So I'll turn it over to Bob Levy. Thank you, Allison. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. At does my cholesterol choked heart good to see so many people are still interested in words because it's a love affair that I've been engaged in for a very long time, very long. Here's how I'd like to run this today. Uh, this is your session. It is not ours. And that means that you could, should, and will ask questions at any time, please. Don't be bashful. Uh, don't stand on ceremony. Stick your hand up if you feel you want to or need to. Bust into the proceedings. We're here to help you. What I want to do is to ask each of the five panelists in turn to describe their careers a little bit in a little bit more detail, and particularly linking those careers to who they were and what they did when they were students at the University of Chicago. Then we're just going to open it up. Uh, that means it's your cue. Uh, anything you want to know about this diverse world of media, uh, we're here to help you learn. And we're also here to give you hard and fast advice. Uh, you're not going to hear a lot of hearts and flowers about wither the media. Uh, you might hear some of it. We want to be able to tell you how to tailor yourselves as individuals uh, when the time comes to uh, seek a job and get a job. Uh, I do want to uh, add this thought uh, as a preamble that uh, everybody in this room can work in this realm. Everybody in this room can work in this realm if he or she wants to do it. 
here comes my maroon speech, but every one of you who has gotten to this university and is getting through this university is going to discover one day when you are no longer at this university just how valuable you are and it is. It is amazing. You will find this. It is amazing how much better educated you will be than the people out in that great wide world out there. Uh, I've, been uh, I've been off this campus now for 44 years, and I can tell you that it's still true. It's amazing. It's still true. So have confidence in yourselves. Go for it, and let us help you go for it this afternoon. Let's go from my right to left one at a time. We'll take a minute or two to, uh, ex to uh, amplify a little bit on who we are and what we've done. All right. Can you guys hear me like this? Is that good? Diana, you may want to use right. that. <laughs> Take it up. Hi, I'm Diana Gill. I run EOS, which is the science fiction and fantasy imprint at HarperCollins. Um, so one thing the UFC prepared me for is to lead the life of a professional geek. Um, <laughs> I am. I, I edit science fiction and fantasy for a living. <laughs> and I'm totally happy doing it. Um, what do you think of the new doctor? <laughs> I actually have not seen it. The problem with being in publishing is that my time is far more limited than I would like, yeah. but I have friends who have been talking about the end of the season for weeks, and I keep promising them someday I'm going to watch it. Um, so I was an English major and an East Asian minor in school, and I graduated, and I was like, huh, I'm either going to get a job in publishing or I'm going to go teach in Japan. And I didn't really know which it was going to be, and then I pretty much waited for a job offer and publishing got me first. So I moved to New York and I got an apartment and I started working and about a month later, a uh, school in Japan called me. And I was like, but, 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 and I stayed with publishing uh, and I've been there now, God, a long time. Uh, and it's been great. Um, I think one of the things that helped the most at the UFC is I actually had, um, I had an internship over this one summer um, with a running press in Philadelphia, which does the little miniature books. And then my junior year, I actually got an editorial assistant position with Modernism and Modernity, which was one of the journals on, on campus. So I spent a year and a half working as an editorial assistant, which meant when I went to go look for a job, I knew a lot of what was happening. And that was absolutely invaluable in terms of getting my first job in publishing and going from there. Um, I started at a science textbook company, and I did that for a couple of years, and I was like, I really don't want to deal with OCHEM and physics and calculus anymore. I really don't like this. <laughs> and there was a position open doing science fiction and fantasy. I went, hey, I like that stuff. I could do that. And I got that job, and then I started running the imprint, and now it's years later, and that's what I do. <laughs> I'm Justine Nagan. I'm the executive director of Cartemquin Films uh, here in Chicago. It's a 44-year-old social issue documentary company founded by three U of C grads uh, in 1966. Uh, we do long format uh, films. Most of our stuff starts on the festival circuit and then uh, usually has a national broadcast, often on PBS, sometimes on IFC, um, Showtime, other outlets, and then we do a DVD and digital release. Um, my path, uh, in a nutshell, I uh, did my undergrad at UW-Madison. I did just about every media internship possible. I did the newspaper, I worked at public radio, I worked in advertising, um, and then I started studying film and worked at public television. And it was a great job. I learned how to produce, I learned how to edit, and then as happens at uh, nonprofits and public broadcasting, I got laid off. Uh, got a job at a small uh, post production company. Loved editing, uh, loved the creative process, but decided I was a social person and that spending eight hours in a day by myself uh, in a room with no windows and a computer um, was not my destiny. So, tried to figure out what the next chapter held and decided to go back to grad school. And this is how I ended up at University of Chicago. Uh, I did my master's here. Uh, it was a transformative time in my life. Um, I really, during my time at Madison, because um, I started as a journalism major and continued that, but also did um, film, I didn't get a lot of theory. I got a lot of practical training, and part of what attracted me about the University of Chicago program was um, the high level of academics, but also that it was uh, that I could kind of. Uh, bulk up on my theory, as you might know. <laughs> um, but during my time there, it, it turned into be, uh, 
into a much broader experience. The contacts that I made while I was at University of Chicago um, brought me directly to the job I have now. Uh, I had known about Cartemquin previously, but they um, were in their kind of post-hoop dreams bubble where they had no way to contact them at all. Uh, no phone number, no email, no nothing, and I kind of forgot about them. And then when I came to University of Chicago, um, Judy Hoffman, one of the professors there, it was like the second day of school, and at a meet and greet, she said, oh, and I'm an associate of Cartemquin Films, and this light bulb went off. and. Um, it was it was an amazing contact, uh, and the other students that I met, I you know remain in touch with today, and so that was a big part of it for me. Um, I learned a lot, and then also um, you know I did a work study job, learned grant writing, um, many many skills that I learned during my time there are helpful helpful now. And I'm also a filmmaker, but uh, being executive director is the <laughs> takes the bulk of my time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Justine. I uh, am a dinosaur. I have spent my life in a business that is changing faster than any in the world, and that is print journalism. And for me, the trouble all began on my first day at the University of Chicago when, by my own prearranged plan, I walked into the office of the Chicago Maroon and said, hi there, I'm 17 years old, and I want to be a journalist for you. And now I'm a lot older, and I still absolutely love print journalism. I always have and always will. And for me, the whole way of looking at the unfamiliar that you know so well at the University of Chicago has proven to me to be the methodology that works for me in journalism. We speak more excruciatingly and more often than in classrooms at the University of Chicago. So you're in the right place if you're interested in the process of journalism. You're also in the right place if you love the written word, and I do. Uh, I've written more words than anybody you're ever going to see in your whole life. I spent more than 36 years on the staff of the Washington Post. For more than 23 of those years, I wrote a daily column. Yes, every single day. Uh, I never missed a deadline. Apparently, I am still alive. And I really do say that the ability to do that and to serve up words by the ton came from my days here at the University of Chicago, where you've got to be glib, and you've got to be fast, and you've got to be thorough, and all of those values that daily journalism embraces and I think exemplifies. I've done many, many other things with my career in addition to my time in daily journalism. I've had a 30-year career in radio and television. I've been a uh, talk show host or commentator on nine radio stations and four television stations or networks. I was <coughs> chosen in the 1990s as one of the most important radio talk show hosts in America, but not, I'm happy to say, one of the most self-important talk show hosts in America. <coughs> I still do uh, and have done for 30 years commercial voice work, which doesn't quite compute perhaps with those of you who like to uh, write for a living, but you know, they dealt me this voice and somebody said you ought to be doing advertising and so I have been for 30 years. And if any of you hear a Midas muffler commercial on the radio, I'm sea to shining sea. And I say these words at the end of that commercial, open Saturdays from nine to noon. <laughs> you'll know it's me. If you ever need a muffler on Saturday, you'll know it's me. I've written three books. Uh, I uh, am now, uh, now that I retired early from the post six years ago when the ground began to move under big time daily journalism and I decided to leave because it was leaving me. This may be a, a discussion for smaller groups later on. If any of you really want to know where the print journalism business is going, it's going to take me a little too long to explain it in depth, so I don't want to take time now. I just want to say that I'm available to any of you who want some guidance in this area. I start Monday as a professor at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., teaching journalism. I've been a professor at five other universities or an adjunct or a student newspaper advisor. I also am in love with fundraising, and I do this uh, as a uh, special assistant to the president of United Way in Washington, D.C. I still write regular columns for three publications, uh, one of them national, two of them local in Washington. And I'm just delighted to see all of you here and would be happy to advise you in any of these areas. I get to, I get to do this rock star style. 
Is, is it working? I don't even it's hear. Working. Okay. Um, I'm Elizabeth Fama, and I'm a children's book author. Um, how many of you raise your hand if you want to write fiction or think you might want to write fiction? Uh, of those, how many think they want to write children's or young adult fiction? All right, so there are going to be people at my lunch table. <laughs> um, I am an embarrassing uh, product of the University of Chicago. I was born in the U of C hospital. I went to the lab school. I went to the college. I got my MBA and my PhD here. <laughs> uh, and I have uh, four kids who went through the lab school and two who are in the college right now, two of those four. Um, one is, uh, one is in, as a junior this year, and I asked her if she was going to the Taking the Next Step program, and she said, uh, I got an email about it, and I looked at it, and none of the panelists seemed interesting <laughs> to me. <laughs> uh, so um, I had a very circuitous route to writing. Um, I was a biology major with honors. I was pre-med until I worked in a, a lab and uh, I wanted to do research and clinical work. And I worked in a lab and realized that, uh, that I couldn't do that uh, and with, uh, with lab rats and surgeries and uh, I couldn't do that. And then I realized that to the process of getting to be a doctor, you actually you had to be, um, when you're in the internship and residency part, you had to like stay up all night and that wasn't going to work for me. <laughs> so uh, I really loved, loved my economics classes in college. And so I went to the, uh, to the uh, business school PhD program. Um, and in the middle of writing my dissertation, uh, I already had uh, one child. I, fr from reading books to her, this happens to a lot of uh, children's book writers, I remembered the books from my childhood. I remembered how important they were to me. Um, and I enjoyed reading them to her so much, I began writing children's books in secret because uh, it was too dichotomous <laughs> a thing to mention to my peers, my PhD peers, that I was writing children's books. Um, and I kept writing secretly, using my babysitting time to write children's books instead of my dissertation, uh, and at a certain point, my husband said, you're torturing yourself. You should either quit and do this or finish and then decide. So I finished. I got my PhD in economics and finance, uh, and then I stayed home and worked on the second half of that novel. <laughs> so um, that's my history. Um, and uh, were those the things that you wanted us to cover, our educational? Yep. Yeah, that's it. I'm uh, John Bruner. I'm with Forbes magazine. I'm an editor. Um, in, the, in the fall of 2005, which was the fall before I uh, graduated from the college, I got this idea that I would go into journalism, and particularly uh, magazine journalism, because I thought it would offer the same kind of sort of self-directed inquiry that a lot of college at the University of Chicago offered. Uh, I was a, a math and economics major, uh, but writing had always been something that I had enjoyed. I really loved math because it was a unique way to sort of see the world and compile um, information to make conclusions, not not as a way to sort of like calculate the surface of a cone or something. And the, the combination um, of math and economics and writing led me toward uh, the business press, <clears throat> which which also happens to be one of the more stable parts of the print media. Um, a few of my professors in the college helped introduce me to editors at um, several big magazines and newspapers. I spent a lot of my senior year in college and the summer after graduating um, going back and forth to New York to sit in editors offices and tell them why they should hire someone straight out of college who had never written anything for any publication ever. And that that last bit turned out to be something of a problem. Um, it, in, in journalism, more than a lot of careers that you might be considering, um, experience is, is important, even if it's um, you know regular articles for the maroon. That's a, a really important thing to, to show someone who's considering hiring you. So I, I ended up going um, 
I finally talked Forbes magazine into hiring me as a as a researcher in their statistics department on the basis of my math background. And this was a really fortunate way to go in. Um, my my work for the statistics department only ended up taking about three hours a day, and I could spend the rest of the day introducing myself to other editors and writing for them. And so I wrote as much as I possibly could. In the summer of 2007, um, I started to uh, to oversee our coverage of the 2008 presidential elections. I put together a big package in the summer of 2007, back when there were like 16 viable um, primary candidates for the Republican and Democratic parties. We um, did a tremendous amount of research on them, involving a lot of interns and uh, many hours of pouring through statements and speeches and so forth, and put together a, a big package on the presidency, and on, on uh, sorry, the, the candidates, uh, along with a blog, which I then continued to edit through the 2008 elections. Uh, that the the blog um, got a reasonable following, and we had a great deal of fun with it. And so in uh, Early 2009, I became an editor, where I'm I'm now uh, in charge of new. We call them new products. Uh, what they are, new ways of presenting content to our to our readers, both in the magazine and online. This means um, special packages of of content, which in the online means an, sort of an index page with a bunch of articles connected to it. In the magazine, special series of articles. I've and. Uh, Lately, I've worked a lot on interactive things on on the website, interactive maps, interactive graphics, things that take a great deal of data and present them meaningfully to readers. Um, soon, it's it's going to involve uh, it in the next six months. I'm going to be doing a lot of work on ways <laughs> to embed our articles and our graphics and things in other people's blogs and and websites. Really spread our our reach that way, and also on um, working with these gigantic databases that we've been slowly building up over the last couple of decades with information on people and companies and places, um, thinking about how to use them to, to generate vast numbers of automatic, um, automatically generated web pages about those people, places, and companies and selling the data in them. So I'm, I'm working a lot on um, uh, how, to, how to take important journalism of the sort that we've been doing since 1917 and uh, bringing it into media that people are interested in in using these days taking advantage of, of new technology on the uh, on the website to publish uh, our our journalism in in new ways thank you panel ladies and gentlemen your turn questions welcome if you have a question for a particular panelist, please say so when you ask it. If you want to just lob a general hand grenade up here, that's fine too. But please make that clear and uh, show of hands. Who'd like to be first? Yes. I don't have a question. I found it very interesting. All of you mentioned that in your early career search, you tended to take jobs that might not have been exactly what you wanted, but that were somewhere in the related career field. What do you advise about it? We are uh, hiring interns right now, and so I've been waiting through applications. Um, and um, Justine, can, can you guys repeat the question? For the oh, sure. The question was, uh, it was a good question, saying that she noticed on the panel a lot of us took positions that weren't exactly what we were passionate about. And she's wondering, should um, she pursue that path and take a job she may not be crazy about or wait until the perfect job comes, something like that. Um, Whatever job you do, uh, and a lot of people have to pay the rent and take <laughs> take a job. Um, if you do it well, it will take you far. And when we're looking at even intern applications, um, if someone can show that they have good writing skills, that they've worked in an office, and they know you know how to be professional, they know how to answer the phone, they know um, you know kind of basic skills. Beyond that, if um, if they can do customer service, you know whatever that career path. Um, tells us those skills are really helpful um, and we take them seriously uh, even though they aren't documentary film related um, they count and so um, and also references from bosses that say that uh, whatever the job was if you were making ice cream cones or if you were um, working at a movie theater whatever that was if you did it well um, it counts for us 
I'm going to second what Justine said. Um, as I said, I started in science textbooks. Uh, my family was in science. I didn't want to be in science. I, I initially thought I was, and I was like, yeah, no, I like writing. I like that. But it was a job in publishing. It was a job in the field that I was interested in. I don't think, I mean, I don't know if I actually have my perfect job now. I lucked out, and a lot of what I do is my perfect job. Um, if they wanted to send me to Fiji and edit from there, that would be, probably be my perfect job. <laughs> but I totally lucked out. And the reason I got the science fiction job and then got promoted like two months later and then took over like four months after that, four years after that, was I came in, and I came in with the two and a half years I'd done in textbooks. So that my the boss that I, start, I switched over to in science fiction needed somebody who could take over a large number of books very quickly. She wouldn't if it, if I had no experience whatsoever, I would not have gotten the job. I wouldn't have gone from there. I think no matter what, you can't sort of assume your perfect job is going to be there when you walk out the door. Um, I don't think that's true. No matter what you are at what level of any career, the key thing is as Justine said. Prove you can work in an office. Prove you can you can file. Prove you can talk to people without stumbling or, and you know what office etiquette is. From there, get your foot in the door and go from that. I'm going to third it. <laughs> uh, what I see so often among young people when they think about careers is thinking in a linear way. Your career is organic, it will last for 45 years, it will be lots of things, it will take you into unexpected directions. What you want out of the University of Chicago and out of this seminar today is a little more insight on how to be able to navigate that world. And that means the ability to bounce sideways. The office culture, the dream job, uh, those should always be in your mind but so too should the possibility that something will come along when you're 40 years old that will just entrance the heck out of you and employ you and bring your career in a completely different direction. That happened with me in radio and television, for example. I never thought about it once. I was a print guy with his head down, pounding the keyboards. And then when I was 35 years old, I got my first job in the electronic media, and I've never been out of it again. It was obvious that I had a future there that I had never considered bounce sideways. That's what you want to be thinking about. I know it's very difficult at your stage to think about a, a whole career of 45 years and to plunge yourself into the great unknown, but it's waiting for you, and it will be the great unknown. What you want to be able to do is to have the skills and have the confidence uh, to be able to field whatever is hit at you. Uh, sharp bouncing balls, line drives, dribblers, anything and so uh, you can be the person you will keep on becoming. John? Uh, um, well, going into journalism these days requires a sort of circuitous entry. Um, there's, it, it's, it's basically impossible to uh, go straight to sort of staff reporter at a major publication coming out of college. And it's, it's particularly difficult um, for uh, you guys, for University of Chicago graduates to, to make that jump because you'll be competing with graduates from a lot of really good journalism schools whose major advantage isn't a journalism degree, which honestly doesn't make a big difference in hiring, but just that um, for the last four years they've been uh, writing very heavily for really excellent publications. They've been taking summer internships every year. Uh, and they've been networking very hard, so you need to you need to think about ways to to get around that disadvantage. Um, they they involve taking uh, you know unpaid internships. We have we have many, uh, and I'd love to hear from lots of you about our fine unpaid internships, um, or or going through something like I did, where you go into the research department of a of a publication, um, and then sort of work your way up to to a, a writing position. The, the, the key is to just you know go into some part of the business that lets you write and um, you know it doesn't matter what your title is. You can be a, an assistant to an, to an editor, you can be um, a researcher or you know work in the mailroom. Just introduce yourself to editors. Um, journalism is pretty egalitarian. If you, if, if, if you worked in the mailroom and you came to me and you said, I have this great idea for an article, and it was persuasive, I would totally ask for an article from someone in the mailroom. So 
that that you know and 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 given the state of the economy and of the of the industry in particular that that's going to be an, an important uh, way to go in but don't give up your job in the mailroom right yeah exactly right. the mailroom may pay better than uh, than what i make so i it may i I'll, I'll reinterpret Allison's question for, uh, you know, a stay-at-home writer. Um, one question you might have is how to support yourself while you're writing, uh, because you won't get um, paid until you sell a manuscript. Uh, so a lot of writers struggle with, should I have a job while I'm writing? Um, you have to pay the rent, obviously. Um, so uh, unless you are independently wealthy, which is the perfect state to be in if you're a writer. <laughs> uh, uh, th and then I think the question comes down to whether you get a menial job that um, you're not interested in, but it gives you some time to write, or if you uh, get a more serious job. Uh, and I hadn't put much thought in that until I saw this. I don't know if you guys have seen this article. It was in the University of Chicago alumni magazine about an alum, uh, Bern uh, Stephen Bar uh, Barbara, I think his name is, Stephen Barbara, who is a literary agent, uh, also a, a college graduate, and three... Stephen went here? Sorry, yeah. I know him. I didn't really he see knows, him right here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, well, maybe you know the three books that he sold as well, all, all from um, college alums. And two of them were working in the industry when they sold their books. One of them, uh, uh, Laura Schechter, who actually uses a, a pen name for her book, I, I can't find what it is here, but um, sh he got a two book deal for 250,000 for her. Um, but she was an assistant editor at the time, so she was immersed in the field. I don't know how she wrote and read the slush pile at the same time, but um, it does seem to me this is a little bit a trend uh, that people in the business are starting to write a lot. I don't know if you noticed that. Um, that's actually always been the case. I know a number of editors who are writers. I had brief dreams about being a writer and then realized that I work much better improving other people's writing. Um, and to answer the question, A, publishing is incestuous. B, we drink eight obscene amounts of caffeine. <laughs> um, in terms of the perfect job, I want to relate one of my idiotic job mistakes. I made a very couple of very stupid mistakes when I left uh, the university and was starting my job search. And the first, um, I was at, I had interned at Running Press down in Philadelphia, and they had a temporary position open for a couple of months working with an editor because someone was going on maternity leave. And I did it for a couple of weeks, and then I was like, I was incredibly f stupid. I was like, well, it says assistant to the editor, not editorial assistant, and it's temporary, so I don't want to cut myself off in case I get a permanent job. Dumbest idea ever. I could have had two months there, made even more contacts while making money and learning more about publishing, but I mistakenly thought because it didn't say editorial assistant that it wasn't the same job. So that was one of those really dumb things. So as I said, you know, just get in the field somewhere. Um, don't be an idiot and turn down the job like I did. <laughs> More questions? Yes. Um, Stand up, please, so we can all hear you and see you. As someone that really loves learning work, but also really wants to do something for the common good and involved with social justice or human rights on a domestic and international level, is there a way to logically combine those coming out of college, or does one kind of have to Go ahead, Chester. One of uh, a really interesting um, career suggestion that I got from from one of my professors when it looked like my search for a journalism job wasn't turning out very well was that I uh, work for a think tank in Washington. Um, he was kind enough. I, I got a couple of interviews um, and actually an offer from the Brookings Institution um, and and uh, and another one from from AEI. Those kinds of jobs involve, um, you know, a, a lot of that. It's basically advocacy journalism, not so much for a general reader as for you know a, a pretty narrow group of policymakers in Washington. You're you're basically writing editorials every day that'll be, um, you know, read by by congressional staff and um, and members of federal agencies. 
which is a you know it's a great way to 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 use language to 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 affect change um if you're someone who really really just wants to see your your articles printed in a million copies and sent around the country that you know it might not be as as satisfying a direction to go into um in you know but in terms of like a very pragmatic answer there um there isn't a lot of stability in the in the parts of uh straight up journalism that are concerned with social justice which is really unfortunate um and and so you know think tanks can be a good can be a good alternative you can find one that that aligns perfectly with your ideology um a lot of them are very influential and and you know do very satisfying work just one comment to add to that uh, there is still a very high very impenetrable ethical wall within big time paid journalism <clears throat> uh, against advocating uh, however there's no wall against arguing a position as john says and having spent uh, a large piece of my life advocating for positions as a newspaper columnist i can tell you that that's an art that will never go away nor should it because it is what you want in your arsenal i find that the weakest part of young journalist acts is the ability to argue an idea they're better at reporting than they think they are they are better and faster at writing than they think they are but it's hard for people who have not done this for years and years and years to say, what do I really think about this? To step back from it, step back three steps, walk around it, kick the tires, develop an argument, and pursue it. So to your question, I think that the methods of journalism, particularly the methods of advocacy journalism, would work just as well in a nonprofit or an advocacy organization. They just won't go out to a million people a day. <laughs> I'm just going to make the one note, too, that there's a lot of jobs within fields that people don't think of. There's a lot of jobs with nonprofits or with advocacy or with social groups where you do a lot of writing. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be as obvious as I'm going to be a journalist for, you know, whatever, like whatever magazine. Um, same thing in publishing. There's a lot of jobs that are in publishing that aren't being an editor. So there's plenty of places where you would write a lot and could still work with causes that you're interested in. So it's never quite as obvious as it seems. To echo her point, I know someone that um, writes the blog for a major uh, social justice organization's executive director, Penn Pen Rice, or you know, what's the word? Uh, writes it as an alias. No, and there you go. <laughs> Ghost rights, thank you. That's the word I was looking for. Um, and they, they are a, a low-level administrative position, but um, it's pretty funny. What I was just going to say on that is, um, I work for, you know, the company that I work for does do social justice media, and it's something we're very proud of. And when people, um, young people come with your same question, and a lot of times um, what they end up doing is, and it, I'm guessing in print journalism there are similar um, pathways, but they'll end up like shooting wedding videos to make money, and then they'll do their passionate project on the side. Um, and it's, it's one path to go um, if you can't find that perfect job. Is it, wait, this is not my field at all, but isn't there also this huge area of grant writing for people, mm -hmm. for organizations? There that is. <laughs> huge, oh, huge she field. She doesn't want to do grant writing. Yeah. <laughs> I did one word job. Okay, more questions. Yes, sir. Now, I guess this is for the editor and the author, but let's say you have your brilliant manuscript and you think, ah, oh, this is an epic tale, people should read this. Where do you go with it? Do you just start randomly sending it off to publishing houses? Or is there sort of some sort of paper mill you can send it into so where it will be seen by folks? All right, I'll take this one because it's a question that everyone always wants to know. The first thing I tell people when you finish your novel, put it in a drawer for six months, go write something else, then come back to it and look at it again. Um, there's a, a, a very a famous phrase in, in publishing about how you have to write a million bad words before you start writing the good words. And I know that's true for journalism and everything else. You have to practice. Um, there are wonderkins who write their first book and send it out and get it published. Um, but in general, every writer needs time to develop the craft. And the easiest way to do that is to just keep writing. Um, and then once you write something, put it away for a while. Let it sit there because when you're, you're, you're writing something, you have to be so close to it that you can't necessarily see the forest for the trees. 
And that's sort of why editors come in. Our jobs are to be the readers who haven't been living with it in their heads for six months. So we could point out all the places and be like, um, what about this and what about that? Beyond that, in terms of publication, it's very hard. Um, actually, about 1% to 5% of all published authors make enough money to do that as a full-time job. The rest have rich spouses. They have day jobs. They have several jobs. It is not an easy thing. Once you finish it, and it's the absolute best it can be, that means having beta readers read it. That means having going over it and, you know, oh, all the grammar and the punctuation, then you do your research. You go out and you make sure it's in the proper submission format. You find an agent, because most publishing houses don't take submissions at this point, who does something like you like. And the easiest way to do that, go to the bookstore. Look at something that's sort of like what you've done. See who the author acknowledges in the front. They'll talk about their editor, hopefully. They'll, talk, they'll always talk about their agent. And then you can submit to that person. Um, look up every agent I know has um, a website. They're often on Twitter, too. They have their submission guidelines. Don't ignore those. That is the easiest way to be tossed instantly. Because if you like, you know, and that's one thing that you see actually prepares you for, is to do your research. I mean, you can't get out of the school without knowing how to research like crazy. So use that. Go find out who's, who's looking for stuff, what they're looking for, and how they want it. And then you can start querying them and go from there. But I won't lie, it's a hard business. Anybody else? <laughs> I guess you have some it's, thoughts about yeah, this, huh? Yeah, it's a hard <laughs> business. Um, and I want to add that um, in addition to um, writing every day, moving on to new manuscripts when you've finished an old one, um, you also, there are, there are some things that make you a better writer. And one is to have a critique group. Uh, that you work with regularly, so I think that's what maybe you meant by the beta readers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need um, you need. This is a t tough business because you sort of work in a vacuum. It's not like ha uh, being in an office where you can hang out at the water cooler and talk shop. So you also have to go to conferences. I don't know about adult books. Um, there, there's a, an organization for children's books, the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, and they organize uh, conferences that invite editors to come, often panels like this. Uh, and you, if you go to enough of those, you develop an, a professional network. And you, it's l like any other job. You have to have contacts, and you have to have a network. Uh, editors should see your n name and recognize it. And the only way to do that is to put yourself out there. You can't just be a hermit and write. Um, and you, your readers have to be critical. You can't give it to your family and ask what they think, because they'll think it's wonderful. And <laughs> it may be, but it may also be that you need someone who's also working on their craft to look at it. Um, children's books are, may, I, I don't, can't represent adult books, but um, you're still able to submit unsolicited manuscripts, which means unagented manuscripts, to many houses. Um, they, their policies are really fluid, so if they feel like they have a slush pile, which is the unsolicited manuscripts that's threatening to take over their office, sometimes they will put a moratorium on unsolicited submissions, and you have to go to the website or even call them and see what the day you want to send your manuscript out what their policy, their submission policy is. A lot of them, if you're submitting it on your own without an agent, a lot of them have um, rule against multiple submissions. They don't want you to send it, you know, scattershot out to 10 uh, editors. They want you to send it one at, one at a time. Uh, when you're in the slush pile, um, unagented, you're, you, the wait time is long. They, they have a staff of college interns <laughs> who read for them and hand them the good ones, but it takes a long time. Uh, I don't think you can even start to bother them until it's been, you know, a, f a few months. Uh, whereas if you have an agent, it gets read right away because from their point of view, it's already been vetted by a professional. Um, but in children's books, the thing, the phrase everybody likes to say is that it's just as hard to get an agent as it is to get an editor. And I, I think that's that's generally true. So in children's books, lots of people send their manuscripts to both. They're they're submitting them to editors and they're submitting them to agents. You know, hoping to get. But you do have to you do have to have um, you do have to work on it. You do have to practice and learn it. It's amazing how much you learn 
years later when you thought you were a good writer. <laughs> the editor has more to say, and we always listen to the editor. <laughs> um, I just had a couple of other notes. The other thing to help in terms of the research is read what's out there. Um, so you know that you're not doing the same thing that another 45,000 people have already done. Um, and then in terms of agents, you can pretty much always multiple submit or multiple query to agents. You can submit to as many agents as you want. Just tell them. Um, publishing houses, yeah, we really don't like that because there's nothing more frustrating than reading something that's unsolicited and being like, oh my god, I love this, and contacting them and having them be like, well, it's at like four houses and someone's just offering. Um, because the the unsolicited stuff is sadly, and even regularly, sometimes agent submissions is, is sort of what we do after we've done everything for the books we already own. So the wait time can be long. Yeah. <laughs> More questions. Who's next? Yes. John, you want? <laughs> yes. Um, well, first of all, uh, you know, I, I really like working with interesting people. So if you can do anything to show that you're a tremendously interesting person by, for instance, majoring in physics but being a really excellent writer, then you, you like, go to the top of my list. Um, in, in, in the case of uh, journalism, there are a few tools that can really also make, make your resume attractive. If uh, in, in the business press, we really want people who are numerate as well and comfortable with numbers as well as being excellent writers. So if you can, if you, can uh, you know, show that, that you've taken lots of statistics courses, that you can talk about, you know, <laughs> what, what the meaning of, of uh, different statistics is to a general audience, that's, that's very important. There, there are some pieces of software that uh, I really like seeing on resumes like Stata, which a lot of you probably learned through economics programs, um, or, uh, or SPSS, <laughs> or Mathematica, or MATLAB, th these things that help you take big, vast, you know, quantities of information and, and make conclusions about them. Um, if you're interested in journalism, uh, you know, and, and you get a job, most of what you'll be doing is online these days. So. And, and it's an increasingly entrepreneurial sort of atmosphere at, at the online sides of publications. So if you know Flash and ActionScript, that's fantastic. Um, if you know server-side programming languages like PHP or Python or, or browser scripting languages like JavaScript, um, that also makes you very attractive. We, so you kind of, there, there are a lot of people who are excellent writers and it really helps to be able to be an excellent writer plus you know a great data analyst or a really fantastic designer or a great photographer or someone who's a wizard with flash um, so all, all of those are all of those are important but I'm I'm always delighted to see University of Chicago students because they're like incredibly smart and really interesting and uh, it doesn't hurt at all that you're not an English major or an economics major if you want a job at Forbes um, by all means you know, major in uh, in classics, and then just show through other means that you you understand numbers, and uh, or that you have some other area of expertise that's attractive. John, let me take you on here because uh, my answer, of course, would be yes, also. But I want to peel back to your first thought, and that is, <coughs> how good a writer do you need to be? And the answer is you can never be good enough, and you should be working hard all the time on writing, being comfortable in your own skin as a writer, and being fluid and fluent as a writer. I've hired many, many young people in my life in journalism, and every time I come across the work of somebody who really knows how to write, it just jumps up over the pack and is obvious to me and to other people. When I was a student at the University of Chicago, I knew I had to get better as a writer, and I drilled, drilled, drilled on it. I practiced. I majored in English because it made me read all of those books and do all of that writing. I hung out in the Maroon office every single day of my four years for the same reason. There can be no substitute for being a great writer, and that means somebody who can write in a variety of moods, who can tackle a variety of subjects in an equally fluent and literate way, 
there's just no substitute for it. And if you feel you have growth to make as a writer, and everybody in this room does, whether you're willing to admit it or not, drill, drill, drill on it. Because that has to be removed from uh, the equation anytime you're in a job interview situation. You simply have got to be able to do the basic work of what all of us do. And once you can, it will be transformative. And it will also transform your wallet. Uh, this may sound like the stupidest thing ever, but if you, no matter how good of a writer you are, please like proofread your cover letter five times. I cannot tell you how many beautiful writers we have come through that have amazingly verbose cover letters that have typos and spelling mistakes and um, and I throw them in the trash. I mean, to be perfectly honest, like I don't I don't get past it because we need uh, extreme attention to detail. So. Read it, read it, read it. Have your roommate read it um, before you send it out. There's nothing worse than IT apostrophe S in a cover letter when you're <laughs> writing an ITS. It just, that goes straight into the garbage. There's no excuse for that. Yeah, I'm going to agree on the cover letter thing. I have people who write in who are write, who want to be writers, who want to be editors, mm -hmm. and they can't spell or they misspell or they misuse grammar. And There's even a few people in my company, and I keep going up. I'm like, this doesn't work. And they're like, wait. I'm like, but publishing and journalism is communication. It's fundamentally communication. You need to be able to talk well. You need to be able to, more importantly, you need to be able to write well. I mean, and yeah, you cannot proofread read your cover letters enough times. Give it to somebody else because mm -hmm. you can't see it after a certain point. And there's nothing worse. And do you guys read the cover letters first before you read the resume? Mm -hmm. I do. It depends. Sometimes I'll yeah. do either, but the minute there's a mistake or something right. wrong. <laughs> right, because you can't write a cover letter for a writing business when your whole future depends on it, why would these guys ever think you'd write anything compelling or interesting mm -hmm. for them? Yeah, think think about the think about the the writing style of the publication you're applying to when you're writing your cover letter. Reread um, George Orwell's essay "Politics in the English Language," which you probably encountered in high school, but which takes on a new importance if you're thinking of going into journalism. It's all about <coughs> how not to be verbose and how to just be clear and direct. It'll make your writing so much better if you follow those those pieces of advice. Um, you know, you can't if you're if you want to go into journalism, you're going to have to face these like really strict word limits where you know exactly 731 words will fit oh, in a yeah. single page. And if you can't you know get your ideas across in exactly 731 words, then you're going to be a big headache for an editor. In, so, yeah. Sorry, John. In my office at the Washington Post, I had on the wall a one-word reminder. The word was tart, T-A-R-T. -T. And it was not because I pined for a certain <laughs> dessert or because I pined for a certain kind of woman. It was, <laughs> it was because any time I could feel a sentence flying away from me, I would just look at that word on the wall and say, compress, boil, sharpen, do what every writer needs to do, that's journalism. You can pretty much always cut down what you've written, um, no matter what. The other question I have, and I don't know the answer to this, does Little Red Schoolhouse still exist? Yeah. That is invaluable. I know I didn't take it um, because I was actually I was actually lucky. I, I, I sold a short story before I came to school, so I've always been able to write. But I know many, many people who took that, and it was absolutely invaluable, both for p journalism, for publishing, for grad school. The nice thing about the UFC is you've got to get through all those human social classes, so you've got to write, but Little Red Schoolhouse is amazing and wonderful. Um, the other thing, Strunk and White is your best friend ever. Just buy the book, learn the book, and it will really help you. <laughs> Put it under your pillow. <laughs> uh, more questions? Yes, in the back. Stand, please. Thank you. Uh, first bit of advice you should apply for our summer internship. <laughs> um, 
we get about 80 applications for four positions uh, and they start coming in very soon so if you're interested um, please do apply um, so that's one bit uh, but I, I think um, Jonathan's uh, advice was very good. Look at, at positions and companies that you care about or companies you're interested in. And there's a lot of um, small, you know, cable networks, uh, National Geographic Challenge. I mean, I'm thinking of Discovery, um, MSNBC, places that do, um, that might really value your research skills. Um, so I would look, look at those as well. Um, if you're staying in Chicago, uh, there's a company called Towers that does, um, like world's amazing roads, those type of shows, but, um, they also do some <laughs> other exciting work abroad that might pair your two interests. So, um, all right. Thank you. Next question. Yes. Mm -hmm. What do you guys have to say about the recent news in um, publication and journalism mm -hmm. about, you know, from print publications to online media? And what does it mean for us who are going to enter the job market soon? I defer to my younger colleague here because uh, – not only because he knows more than I do, but because I could talk about this all night long and, and don't want to. Go ahead, John. It, 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 the whole field is rapidly changing, and there are no and nobody knows exactly what it should change to. I mean, there there are a lot of models for how publications should behave online, and none of them is is a proven, profitable, you know, excellent model. So there's a lot of experimentation going on, and that means that for all of you who who have probably a better understanding of the digital landscape, what it takes to um, engage, to, to build and engage and keep a, um, you know, an audience to draw them into your story. Um, that, that's a very important understanding. And, and um, if you can demonstrate that you have that understanding by having had a, a popular blog in college or by, you know, introducing some new technology on the Maroons website, you know, you, you covered, uh, the construction of of that new building that I saw on Ellis Avenue and and Fifty uh, Seventh Street, and and you're awesome with like um, computer aided design, you know if you can make a, a great sort of interactive diagram of the building to explain what's going on, a anything you can do to show that you understand fundamentally um, how to how to build and maintain audiences online will will make you very attractive to to potential. Um, employers at the risk of keeping you here all night I'll try to compress this I can never tell a short story but I'm gonna try uh, I think quality always finds its level in any business I don't think that's unique to journalism but I think it's absolutely particular to journalism and I cannot imagine a day when excellent journalism will not find a, 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 a market for itself or a way to to employ journalists like you Brittany what I'm worried about is that the next 20 years of falling in love with the next Twitter to come down the line is going to obscure the real value of what journalism always has been, and that is, here we go, the traditional values that, uh, that it exemplifies every day. You have to be able to write well. You have to be able to report thoroughly and fairly. You have got to be endlessly curious and endlessly willing to work hard for very little money and very uh, bad coffee. All of these things are time honored for a reason. You can't just pitch them over the side and say technology is going to drive the business. You may drive the platform for the business, but I don't think it can drive the business. And here, as briefly as I can, is why I think that. We live in an absolute information age. There's never been a time in history when more information is flying around or more needs to fly around. We live in an age when the cacophony about bias in the media is louder than ever. So therefore, the need for non-biased journalism is greater than ever. And third, we live in a world where being able to do it fast and hot and neat and with fries uh, is exactly what journalism is going to do, demand of you. But that doesn't mean you have to reinvent every piece of it. Uh, I don't think that will ever happen. Just one small story for you. I was in the room 
the day that WashingtonPost.com was invented. I was asked to be on the original group of people who invented WashingtonPost.com, 15 years old this year, uh, then and now one of the most influential news sites in the world. And a couple of guys were sitting there in Converse All-Star sneakers and open neck shirts, my God, <laughs> in those days. And uh, they were talking the way young people talk, uh, you know, like, you know, it's, uh, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> and the suits, can't uh, you, I can't do it, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and the suits around the room were absolutely aghast at this presentation. These people were saying, this is a whole new world, and there's going to be a whole new form of journalism in this world, and there hasn't been. What's happening is some kind of a strange marriage between the technological possibilities and the old ways of doing things. That's the world you're going to go into in journalism. And don't think that Twitter will save you from yourself or from anybody else. What will save you is the ability to be a great journalist. To, to clarify my remarks, uh, our, our written articles are <laughs> always the foundation of what we do. And so that's why um, you know, we want someone who's first a great writer and then understands the you know the digital landscape. You can't you know we're it, you can be awesome with Flash, but not really a great writer, and you're not as interesting as you would be if you were a great writer, and you know kind of okay with Flash. Um, what we what we're looking to do is take our our um, core you know written articles, which are the same as they've always been, and then add um, new ways of presenting the ideas in them to our readers. Uh, using new technology and using new ways to draw in audiences. So uh, that's why, you know, we keep saying this good writing is the, is the number one thing you have to think about. And then after that, think about, um, you know, other things you can layer on top of it. One other point, if I can, I'll get to you in just a sec. Uh, as you look for jobs and begin to think about careers, uh, and I know you're all wordies in this room or we wouldn't be in this room, one piece of advice, I hope you will investigate the business situation of any em prospective employer. It is so critical so that you don't go face first into a disaster or face first into something you don't want to be part of. Interesting, but that barely pay. I mean, it, it's, it's worth it because when you're 35 and you want a family, um, it'll be really hard to justify taking a, a $25,000 a year editorial assistant position in Manhattan. So um, use that to your advantage. So you set up the perfect segue for my question, which is with so many old names in print, shutting down bureaus here, chopping stabs there, is there international reporting outside of AP and Reuters that we could go apply to work in? Sure, and sure there is. As a more broad panel question, What's the cheapest way to eat? <laughs> ramen noodles, right? Ramen noodles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had a friend at the Washington Post whose age at this moment begins with a three, but when she became my friend, her age had begun with a two. She uh, asked much the same question at your stage. She wanted to be an international reporter. This was when the earth began to shift seriously underneath journalism, and you could no longer assume that AP and Reuters would be the, the big employers. She moved to the Middle East. She just moved there. <coughs> Her parents were absolutely aghast. They said, geez, you know, we'd, we'd love to see you once in a while, but uh, we kind of understand. She went over there with no money, no prospects, and she began knocking on doors and developing stringer ships. She began developing uh, office jobs at, at uh, bureaus of, of uh, some non-English speaking wire services. And after four years in the Middle East, uh, living in various countries, she came back and was uh, instantly employable at CNN and she was, was employed and is employed there. So sometimes you have to do it inside out. Uh, get to where you want to go first and then come back to where you thought you might end up when you were 40 because that's where you could end up when you're 40. I think that's even how Anderson Cooper, the uh, CNN television personality, got started. He uh, just got a video camera and went to Iraq during the first Gulf War and then had a great time and came back and got a job. You, you can also um, uh, 
I mean, as a practical matter, uh, Bloomberg and Dow Jones both seem to be at the moment throwing a lot of money into into um, uh, hiring new people. Th those aren't really entry level jobs, and you have to know what you're getting into if you're working for a wire service in terms of the output required. But there there are a few different um, companies that are hiring very fast, and they'll um, pay you very well to go somewhere in the world and, and write about it. More questions? We have about five minutes left. Yes, sir. Uh, sensationalism has, has always been a polarizing style of writing in, in journalism. Uh, what are your thoughts on sensationalism? Uh, how do you, where do you draw a line between sensationalist type writing and objective covering of stories? And how, what methods do you take to, to draw that, that line? Well, let me take this and then the rest of the panel feel free to jump in. I hate sensationalism, but I want to peel that back and make sure we understand each other. I love lively journalism. I love it. There are just some stories that are made for the New York Daily News and the New York Post. Uh, <laughs> that will never win Pulitzer Prizes, but every once in a while you hear about a story that's just too good and you know it's going to be on the front cover of the New York Post. This week's story about the head of the Office of Management and Budget uh, being engaged to one woman, the, the father of the illegitimate child of another, and paying child support to his former wife for two more, and this guy is the nerdiest guy in the world. Now, is that sensational journalism, or is that tee-hee-hee, -hee, everybody's talking about it kind of journalism? Can it be done responsibly? Sure, I think it can be. Is it a tittering sort of story? Yes, it is. But I don't think that means you shouldn't do it. I think it means you should do it carefully because we all like to laugh and we all like to look at people who operate against type. A and uh, there's lots of room for journalism that doesn't trample on the rights of the people being written about. Uh, one of the problems in journalism is that journalism sometimes get a, gets a, ahead of the law, ahead of the police, and ahead of the facts. If it wouldn't do that, that doesn't necessarily mean you still you can't write about subjects that are interesting. Uh, there, I think the best story in America this last week was not the one I just mentioned, but the one involving the, the basketball player in Washington uh, who uh, brought guns into the locker room. Uh, being a, a veteran of talk radio, I can tell you that this has been lighting up uh, switchboards all over the country for 10 days. This story is very controversial. Now. Is that sensationalism by your definition? I don't think it is. This really happened. It's being investigated by real cops and real lawyers. The difference is that the subject matter can be sensational, which this story is, and the treatment of it can be just as fair as it would be if we're talking about a sewer meeting in some suburb of Indianapolis. So make sure you get your terms right here. Uh, the world is a pretty bombastic place and there are some pretty sensational news stories that happen out there, but good journalism is still good journalism. Anybody else have thoughts? I have. In, uh, in my business, I would say sensationalism is um, uh, the big hits like Twilight. That's <laughs> uh, the equivalent, I would say. And um, I think uh, because uh, the acquiring of books has uh, contracted. Uh, most publishers have their lists full for the next couple or a few years, so they're being extremely choosy about what they buy. Um, it does help to have a sensationalist book. It does help to have a pitch or a hook. Uh, the, the woman with the uh, two-book deal uh, wrote a book that she could describe in one sentence as a combination of the lovely bones and Groundhog Day. Um, and, and it gets you noticed. So because everybody w want, they, for, f in, a, in a business that doesn't quite know what its footing is right now, they all want to have a twilight. OK, time for one final question. But before we take it, I'll get to you. One final question. Uh, if you have uh, other questions, come on up and uh, tackle us when we're done. We'll stay up here for you. Yes. Entry-level work, you know, wanting to get an editing side of publishing, and also whether or not you think an English major is kind of necessary, or if you could kind of still work with a computer. 
or literature? Um, the first question on whether you have to be an English major to be in publishing, um, a lot of us are. There's a lot of us who are. There's a plenty who aren't. One of my best hires, who's now a full editor on her own, was in finance and law. And she didn't want to be in those anymore, and she realized she really wanted to be in publishing. So she did a lot of informational interviews, which, by the way, are your best friend. And then she's like, I want to be in publishing. And she was fabulous. You don't have to have an English major. You do need to be able to write. You do need to be able to be interested in it. You've got to love books. Um, you also, when you're interviewing, this, again, seems really stupid, but I've had it happen. Whatever you're, interest, you're interviewing for, make sure you're actually interested in it. I've had people who only want to do extremely literary books, and I do books that go to the bestseller lists, and they're like, well, I don't really like commercial books, or I don't like genre <laughs> books. And they said this in the interview, and I was like, why, why are you here? Why are you wasting my time? You don't want to do what I do. I don't want you here. So there's that. Um, in terms of the day-to-day -day stuff for an editorial assistant, everyone thinks that editors sit at their desk and read books with preferably with bonbons, and every editor and every assistant I know would sign up for that job tomorrow. You do a lot of office work, a lot of trafficking of stuff, making sure the materials go to the right departments, um, and making memos to make sure you can prove that they went to the right departments. There's a lot of filing, there's a lot of faxing, there's a lot of typing of really boring stuff, but that's where you start, and that actually is invaluable. Like when you're filing in general, read what you're filing because you can learn so much from it. Um, the editorial assistants also handle a lot of the slush, the unsolicited, unsolicited materials. Um, so they're sort of the first vanguard on the reading. Um, that, unfortunately, is not usually in the office. Um, so a lot of what you start out with is office work. Um, and that's important, because if you can't do the faxing, you can't do the filing, I can't trust you to do something when I ask you to, I'm never going to give you something bigger. Because if you can't do basic, boring office work, I can't trust you to do anything else. So that's a lot of it. There's also meetings, writing cover copy, a lot of email, um, and then fun stuff like talking with the authors and coming up with things, um, working on covers, working on copy, working on marketing ideas, working on online stuff like blogs, Facebook, Twitter, blah, blah, blah. Um, so it varies. Every day is different. But there's always books, and there's always lots of stuff. <laughs> Panel, thank you very much. Folks, thank you. Keep typing. More questions if you have them.